You guys enjoying it anyway? Good times? That was some good, solid Bible teaching straight from the text, the kind that you guys know I appreciate very much. Just uh, straight up Bible, no getting all fuzzy about it or making it uh, comfortable or commercial. Just Bible. It's, uh, it's missing in our culture, so I really appreciate that. Uh, my goal today is to speak about Jesus as a man. So often we have arguments and debates talking about whether or not Jesus is God, whether or not he is uh, a person of the Trinity, or if the Trinity exists, or all those different things. And I'm not going to debate those, I'm not going to get into those. One thing that's often forgotten about, and not spoken of much, is the fact that Jesus came in the flesh. The Bible says in 1 John, actually, that if people believe or teach that Jesus did not come in the flesh, they are the Antichrist. So, so often we think, well, that person doesn't believe that Jesus is God the way I think. They should believe it, so maybe he's... Um, a heretic or a, a person that may be a uh, part of the Antichrist movement. But here in John, 1 John, he actually says that if anybody teaches that he has not come in the flesh, physical, natural, fleshly human being that can cut and bleed and is tempted and uh, gets sick and sore and all those different things, if you don't teach that, then that's a, um, an indication that someone could very well be part of the Antichrist movement. So... I'd like to go back, though, before we begin, go back before there was anything, before there was a ball of earth, before there was any angels, before there was any cherubim and seraphim and all the glory that we see and feel and taste and touch, there was God. And that's a thought for me, I don't know if you've ever considered it, um, what was before these six or ten or thousands of years, however many years that angels and cherubim have been around, what was there? Well, God was there, and yet He was by Himself and yet not lonely. He was uh, alone, but perfectly loved, perfectly in communion and uh, fellowship within himself, being a three-person Godhead. He, everything happened according to his own will, for there was only one will in existence. There was no other will in the universe. There was one will, and it was God's, and everything happened according to his will. And... Uh, there was God, perfectly content, perfectly loved, perfectly in fellowship, full of life. And as you know, life always begets more life. And so God looked around and thought, I want friends, I want family, I want people to share my love and my joy with. And so he began this great creation that we are all a part of. Um, God created beings that also had the capacity to choose ones that would have a will like unto himself. He created us in his image, it says, so that we could decide and choose and will to do things. And without the ability to will, without the ability to love or hate, without the ability to decide, rather, we could not love or hate. We would be autobatons. We'd be robots on the end of God's strings, maybe, that are just acting based on what God wants. But the only way he could actually get love and affection from us, or the only way he could have someone turn against him in rebellion, would be to give us a full capacity to think and feel and will on our own, apart and separate from himself. So God created subjects that had the ability to decide not to follow him. And as you know the story, that's exactly what man has decided to do. But if God wanted people to serve him wholeheartedly, they had to have that option. And as you can see, if you've ever read the scriptures, uh, you go back to Genesis, and it only takes a very, very short time into the beginning of creation, and you see humanity has majorly, majorly failed God. All through the history of the earth, you see man after man rising up and falling down, stumbling, making a mess of things, creating, making a mess of creation often, a mess of God's plans. And uh, by the time Christ came upon the scene, some 2,000 years ago, it looked hopeless. It looked as if there was no chance that humanity could survive, that humanity could pull itself out of uh, the ditch that we were in. Uh, Christ came and it looked hopeless that we would ever find a hero that could accomplish the task of saving the human race. It was a mission impossible, so to speak. Uh, God always seems to allow things to get to the point where there's no earthly hope left, where there's no way you can look at it and say, well, I can, I can see how we could work this out. 
there's a slight glimmer of hope here. He allows it to get to the point where there's absolutely nothing. Like um, Chris was saying before, that Abraham got to be a hundred years old, to where his body was as good as dead, and he looked over at his wife, totally past the childbearing age, no longer able even to have pleasure, totally wrinkled and old and saggy, nothing left. There's no chance. All hope had been stripped away from Abraham, and he still had hope. He still did not waver that he would have a child, the Bible says. And that's, that's where the place that God wants people at before he can save them, and that's exactly the place that he got this whole world to before he sent Jesus. We look back at a few things um, in the garden shortly after the fall of Adam and Eve. God promised Eve that her seed would come and crush bruise the serpent's head. The serpent that had deceived and beguiled Adam and Eve would one day be defeated by a seed of the woman. And that's very significant that it was an actual person, a son of one of these earthlings. Not a child of heaven, not a masterpiece in the disguise of flesh, not some great superhero that's just donning on some flesh for a period of time, but inside he's this superhuman that can do anything. He was a seed of the woman. He came like as unto one of us. You look back at Abel, Abraham's, I mean, uh, Adam's first son, or second son, Cain and Abel, and finally there's a glimmer of hope that here's one of the seed of Eve. Could this possibly be the promised child? And as you see the story, Cain kills Abel, nothing happens there, and hundreds of years go by, there's man after man rises up. You see Seth and a few other men that are noted in the scriptures. But the time it gets to the days of Noah, there's no hope left in the earth again. There's nobody on the earth that is doing righteousness. There's nobody on the earth that's worshiping God. And one man finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so all of humanity, all of creation, all of nature is looking at this one man and thinking, is God's promise finally going to be fulfilled? Here's the one man that we've been waiting for, the seed of the woman, Noah. And uh, as you see, shortly after the flood, the earth is destroyed. There's only eight souls left on the earth. And uh, one of his sons walks into Noah's tent a few years later, finds him, finds him sprawled out naked in his tent, had got drunk off of his own wine that he had made, and another one gets wiped off the slate. We know that that's not the promised man that was to come. A few years go by, Abraham is chosen. He's taken out of the land of the Ur of, Ur of Chaldees. He's brought to a place that God was going to show him and give him a great nation. And so again, there's this hope that rises up in the earth that maybe Abraham is the promised one that's going to crush the serpent's head. He gets many promises given to him. I'm not going to go through all these details, but there's hope there, but it's dashed again. He's promised that he will have a child. Isaac becomes along. And Isaac it gives the earth some hope. Isaac begets Jacob. Jacob, there's a little bit of hope there. But it's always one after the other. There's, you see their failures. You see their faults. You see their shortcomings. Man after man fails to fulfill the plan of God. Fails to complete that uh, Savior position completely. And along comes Joseph, the young Joseph that was sold as a slave, one of the most righteous men in the Old Testament. Never a fault spoken of in the, in, in, of him. It's always just says good things of him in the scriptures. And yet we see him taking the children of Israel into Egypt. Some th hundreds of years later, jo Moses rises up and he leads the people victoriously out of the land of Egypt into the wilderness. And again, there's a glimmer of hope. Maybe God is going to use Moses. And at one point, actually, God says, Moses, I am so sick and tired of these people. How about you just move aside and I'll wipe them out like I did in the days of Noah. And I'll start over with you. So here's this man, you know, one man. God has chosen one man, and he's standing before God. There's a glimmer of hope again. But Moses convinces God to stay his hand, to allow the children of Israel to live on, to see another day. And uh, Moses is not the man. You see him coming short, and he's not even allowed into the promised land. After Moses, you see the judges rising up in the land of Canaan. Judge after judge, uh, Gideon and Saul, Samson and Deborah and many others that rise up there and do some great things. Finally, at the end of that period of Judges, there's a great man rises up who was given to God by his mother. His name is Samuel. And again, Israel is rising up in hope. Creation is moaning and groaning, waiting for this day when finally there's some hope in the earth and they see Samuel as this righteous, godly man and he falls short. He's not the man that we've been waiting for. But there's much good done through him and he anoints King Saul. 
And Saul is this great noble man who is so humble and lowly. He doesn't want to lift himself up in pride at all. And you see his shortfall coming a few years later. And he's replaced by King David, the greatest king ever lived. Solomon comes after him. He was the richest, most wise man in all of the earth that's ever lived to this point. And all these little glimmers of hope, you see them rising up and falling back down. And then there's king after king. Most not so good. A few good kings in the mix. But you see again and again, God choosing out a man. When the people had all gone astray, they'd all turned their own way. They'd all gone to idol worship and uh, false gods and idolatry and adultery and so many wicked things. God would choose one man and raise him up to be a prophet, to be a priest, to be something. And he would lead the people back on the right path. But he was never quite complete. He was never the perfect savior. And there was constant promises waiting for and promising of this great promised deliverer that should come that was promised to Eve so many years ago. After, in the scriptures, after the kings are spoken of, there's a 400, period, 400 years of silence where God does not speak to the children of Israel. There's no voice from heaven. There's no prophet sent from God. All the people on, in Israel are waiting. They're anticipating. They're waiting for this promised deliverer. But nothing comes. Generation after generation. Imagine telling your children, you're going to hear from God. God's going to send a deliverer. God's going to send His promised Savior. The seed that's going to crush the serpent's head. He's coming. And your child gets older. He gets married, grows up, has his own children. And you keep telling him, He's coming. And he gets older and he's got kids and their kids grow up and their grandkids come along. And soon there's this young guy that was told that prophets had come. Told that the Messiah would come. And he's never seen a thing, he's never heard a thing, and he's telling his grandkids and his great-grandkids, and nothing happens. 400 years of silence where they're just waiting. There's no hope. There's no man called out. There's no uh, glimmer of hope left. Humanity has come to the worst place in history when, in due time, when it was perfect for God to send his son. Finally, there's a voice of one crying in the wilderness, making straight the paths of the Lord. And John the Baptist is out in the wilderness crying out to the people to repent and prepare for the coming Messiah. And there's again this rising up. Israel starts to stir. The dead bones seem to start to come awake. Everybody's anticipating now the arrival of this great promised deliverer. Can you, can you envision that hope, that uh, anticipation that they must have had? Finally, I, I heard about this from my great-grandpa. I heard about this from the prophets and the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. I knew this day was coming, but now it's possibly here. And so they go out to see this great man of God in the wilderness crying, and they ask him, the priests and the uh, Pharisees, they ask him, are you the Christ? Are you the promised one that should come? And he, you know, with all their hope, everybody's anticipating what's the answer going to be. Is he the one that was sent from God? He says, no, I'm not the one. I'm only come to prepare the way for the one that was to come. And so that's where I want to look at. Um, speaking of this one man, Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God. We've heard this earlier today. There is only one God. He's in heaven. Everybody seems to agree to that. He sits on His throne in heaven, high above the earth, and He looks down upon this planet. He created all things. There's one God. And one mediator between God and and men. Who is this mediator? Who is this go-between that can bring both God and man together? That can allow us to meet the eternal creator? Which mediator could this be? It says here, the man, Christ Jesus. And I think the words are very specific. It doesn't say the God-man. It doesn't say the Son of God, Christ Jesus. It doesn't say the superhero or some other earthly being that's not like us. He says, the man, Christ Jesus. He's the mediator between us and God. There is one man now that we can approach unto the eternal God through. He's a human like unto us. He's on our team. He's one of us. And it's very important for us to recognize that. So who is Jesus? Most people, you ask them, who's Jesus? And they'll answer, oh, he's God in the flesh. Uh, he's the Savior of the world. He's uh, the Son of God. Uh, many different answers, and they're not wrong. They're good answers. They're scriptural. They're biblical. We could get into that theology. But most people don't recognize that 
when you read the Gospels, the four stories of, of Jesus, he almost never, almost never refers to himself as God or the Son of God. You get a few glimpses here and there where he lets on to it. Sometimes he says it and he says, don't tell anybody. He's very discreet about his deity. He almost like he's hiding it from everybody, saying, I am, what does he call himself? He says, I am the Son of Man. Eighty-five times in the New Testament, Jesus either called, called this or called himself the Son of Man. In almost every instance when he refers to himself, he says, the Son of Man. The Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. The Son of Man, or the foxes have holes and all that, but the Son of Man has nowhere to stay. And he always refer, almost always refers to himself as the Son of Man. The words Son of God are used 47 times in the New Testament, and literally only maybe a handful of times where Jesus refers to himself as the Son of God. And I, I believe you look at that, 85 compared to 47, and uh, most of the 85, Jesus referring to himself, only a handful of the 47, Jesus referring to himself. There's a huge significance here, something that I think a lot of us have overlooked. Jesus is a man. That's unbelievable if you really think about it. He is a man. He did not come to the earth as the Son of God. And he made that very evident. He said, I am the Son of Man. And it was required that a man come to save us. He needed to be the seed of the woman. He could not be the Son of God, just come down and say, here I am, folks. I'm going to step in between. I'm going to take care of all your problems. It wasn't going to work that way. There was legal obligations for it to be a man. The way God had set creation in motion, the way he had... Uh, designed righteousness and uh, justice, it required that a man be the one to do the saving. That a man be the one that bring us back to the position that we had with Adam in the garden. It had to be a man. The passage that I'd like to turn to is Hebrews chapter 2. That's where we're going to kind of stay and uh, move around a little bit there. But uh, if you have Bibles, turn with me in them. Uh, if you have phone apps, turn them on, open them up. If you don't, it's not too late to repent. There is still hope for you. I really like people following along. I feel like it's uh, very important for you guys not to take my word for things. So Hebrews chapter 2, verse 5. And I'm going to jump into the middle of a context, but hopefully we get enough of the flow so that we're not uh, lost in it. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. The author of the book of Hebrews was speaking about a time to come in the future. A world that's going to come. And Peter says, wherein dwells righteousness. There's a world coming when this world is destroyed. When all that we see here is finally done. The corruption, the evil, the sin, the wickedness is dealt with, done away with. There's a world to come. And it's going to be a beautiful world. It's going to be new and fresh, and there's going to be kingdoms, and there's going to be a, a new Jerusalem placed upon the earth, the most beautiful city you've ever seen. There's going to be um, nations all over the world, people ruling and reigning with Christ. There'll be immortal people, possibly some physical, tangible, uh, mortal people still upon the earth. I don't know what's all going to happen. It won't just be eternal life sitting in the clouds playing harps, and uh, I don't know what picture you have of heaven, but the new Jerusalem, the new earth is going to be awesome. This world in which, the, which is to come has not been placed in subjection to angels. I mean, who could be closer to God than a seraphim, a cherubim that's standing by the throne of God crying, holy, holy, holy. They're these magnificent creatures with two or four or six wings and they're standing before God day and night. Some of them have two or four faces, ox face, eagle's face, and all these different things. You read about some of this stuff and it's like, if anybody should be near to God, it should be them. But this new world that's to come has not been put into subjection to the angels, but rather it's been given unto man, unto humanity. Verse 6, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? We don't deserve God's attention. We don't deserve God's affection. So for him to consider us at all, from the beginning of creation to now, for him ever to step down and look at us and talk to us, to give us some message or to give us some glimmer of hope, is undeserved. 
We don't need it. God, God doesn't need to give it to us. So it's amazing that he would even give us the time of day. What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man? You know, you think of man, and that's Adam. Adam was the first man. He was created directly by God, and he fell into a state of confusion and a mess. He left this world to us in a state that was not as good as what he had given, been given to. But now think of not only that man that was created directly by God, but one of his descendants. That's a far cry from God now. We're talking about the son of man. So I mean, if God considered Adam, I can understand that. But for God to consider us as the sons of men, you know, what, do we, what right do we have to God considering us? What is man that thou art mindful of him? Verse 7, Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownedst him with glory and honor, and didst set him over the works of thy hands. And now this, I believe, is referring back to Adam in the garden. He was placed in the garden, and he was given authority over all the earth. The Bible says that um, in Genesis 1, 26, God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over the, all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So there we see all of creation it's in its perfection. All animals, all the beauty of the mountains and the rivers and all those things. And God has placed all of it in subjection to Adam. Adam's the king of the whole earth. The original earth was placed under the rule and dominion of Adam and Eve. It's a beautiful thing that they had. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels, that you crowned him with glory and honor. Man was made for glory and honor. Man was made to emulate and to portray the glory and honor of God. And there is nothing more glorious than a man and a woman in their proper place under the submission of God and working together with Him and doing things, creating and living and laughing, having a good life. That's glorious. Man was created for glory and honor. So now follow me carefully. This talking about Adam, it says, There has never been a man before, since that time rather, that's been crowned with glory and honor like Adam was. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. I feel like I have to stop there and say, really? Are we still talking about Adam or did we jump to a different person now? Because from what I've seen from the beginning of Genesis right through to today is the, the world has been destroying humanity. Tornadoes and hurricanes, typhoons and tidal waves and earthquakes, volcanoes, all these things destroying humanity by the thousands. Animals even tearing people apart. Sharks biting and devouring people. How is this whole world put in subjection to Adam? Is it speaking of somebody else? Now he continues, he says, but now we see not yet all things put under him. So originally in the garden, all things were placed in subjection to Adam. But now we see that not all things are yet put under him. We clearly see that this world is, is out of control. The whole earth groans and travails together until now uh, Romans chapter 8 speaks of. But, and I always love getting to the good part. I've talked to you guys, the youth, on Friday nights about these buts that are just so awesome in the scriptures. All the world is in trouble. Adam was given this glory and honor, but now we see he's lost it. The world is ruling over humanity rather than humanity over the world. But we see Jesus. But we see Jesus, who also, listen to what it says here, but we see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels, for one purpose. He was made lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So Jesus was placed upon this earth as the man that was going to win the human race back to God. That was going to bring many sons into glory, as he's going to say later on. He was given glory and honor in the same fashion that Adam was given glory and honor in the beginning. And when he had completely become the perfect man, he was given that position of authority, and he had full authority over this planet. How else do you think he was able to walk on water? Not because he was God. It's not because he was a miracle worker. It was because he was the perfect, 
overcoming man that had all the authority and power and dominion over this earth that you and I do not have. Any of you here have control over gravity? Nobody does, right? There's nobody that can stay on top of water. There's nobody that can jump up and stay there. It just does not happen. Gravity has control over all of us. Can you imagine the power that Jesus had to where these elements of this earth were in subjection to him? He got that not because he was God. He got that because he was the overcoming man. He got that because he was the perfect man. We're going to get into that further here. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory. This is God. God had this great desire to bring many sons unto glory. It says that they were all things were by him and all things were for him. God created all things. He created them all for himself. And he had this desire to bring many sons into glory to be with him. He, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. So God, like I said before, God's always wanted friends and neighbors, somebody to share his glory with, somebody to share his love with, and people that he could relate to, live with, and love. Since the beginning, man has rejected God and his advances upon humanity. The whole story of the Bible is that is a history book of God trying to approach humanity and humanity rejecting God's approaches, turning away from God's love and mercy and grace. Read the Bible, you'll find it's a story of man's failure to, uh, to do anything right. Does he say, step aside, you useless humans? Here's God to come and take over? No, he doesn't do that. He does the unthinkable. He comes down into humanity not as a great God. He comes down into humanity as a little tiny baby, totally meek and helpless, totally dependent upon a woman. Can you imagine God nursing at his mother's breast? Can anybody imagine that? Can you wrap your minds around the fact, here's this God that's created all things, all things for his own glory. The huge mountains that reach 29,000 feet into the air. The stars and the galaxies, all the planets. I can't even speak of those things the way some people can make them sound so awesome. You just go out at night and you stare at these stars and you're like, wow. The God that made all those things, that looks down upon them from the third heavens, came into human history as a baby. How could the, the fullness of God be placed inside this tiny little fetus that grew into a young boy, stumbling about learning to walk. It's incredible. He had to go through all the same steps that you and I go through. Here was God in the flesh, totally, totally fleshly, totally human. Hebrews 5, 7, a couple chapters after this says about Jesus, who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, though he was God's son, it does admit that he was, he was the son of God, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So what it's saying here is that, yes, he was a son. Philippians 2 says that he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus in the flesh, this man that was on the earth, he said, I and my Father were one. I'm, I'm in the Father, the Father's in me. We're one in, in being, one in essence. We're, we're perfectly in unison. I am God. He admits that. But yet, he had to go through steps. He had to go through suffering. He had to go through trials to learn like a human learns. Can you imagine him growing his first teeth? Him learning his first words? learning to say no for the first time to a temptation that came his way. And it does say later on in Hebrews that he was tempted in all points like as we are. In all points like as we are. Jesus was tempted to look at naked women. You think that harlot that was brought before him, caught in the very act of adultery, do you think she was well clothed, brought into his presence, all fully covered and modest? No, these hypocrites grabbed her in the very act of committing adultery and dragged her before Jesus and said, Jesus, what should we do with this woman? He was tempted in every point like as we are. It's hard to fathom. But he totally subjected himself to our limitations. He limited himself to the same places that we're limited in. 
So often we can think, well, God, no wonder Jesus was able to do he could, all he did is because he was God. No, he wasn't. For that period of time, he laid aside his divinity. He laid aside his, his um, God-like powers. And he only used what was at his earthly disposal. Even the miracles that he performed, the walking on the water, the raising the dead, the healing the sick and the lame and the blind, that was not because he was God. That was because he had full authority over this earth the same way Adam had in the beginning. The whole earth was in subjection to Jesus. He was in the wilderness where the wild beasts were, it says, when he was being tempted for 40 days. Verse 9 of Hebrews chapter 5 says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now let me ask you, was Jesus not perfect? Was there something about Jesus that was not right? Oh, of course he was right. I mean, we believe that he was the word of God in the beginning that created all things. He was perfect in every way. And it says here that he was made perfect and he became the author of eternal salvation. What is this talking about? He was not perfect in one way. There was one way in which Jesus was not complete, not perfect. And that was that he could not identify with us. If he would have stepped in as God to come and destroy the devil, to come and save us from our sins, we never would have appreciated him the way we now do. We know that he became like us in all points. And then he came, became our Savior. He became perfect through sufferings, the Bible says. Luke uh, 10, verse 17. This is a slight um, cross-reference, but it's, uh, it's quite unrelated, but at the same time, I really appreciate the... The idea of it. Jesus had just sent out his disciples to go into all the surrounding areas in Israel and to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to make the lame to walk, to cause the deaf to hear, the blind to see, and all those things. He said, go out and do this. Cause the evil spirits to go out of people. And they went in the name of Jesus, and they did these things. And the 70, verse uh, Luke 10, 17, it says, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject to us through thy name. Even the devils were subject to these mere fishermen. Can you imagine a fisherman? A fisherman. Just the lowly casual worker. I think of a construction worker, a drywaller, a painter. You know, these dirty, filthy, rotten guys that don't deserve... I'm not saying all of them are. Don't deserve anything. And here they are standing before a devil. And they're saying, I demand you, get out of him. And what did the devil do? It was gone. And they said, even the devils are subject to us in thy name. In which name? In the name of Jesus. Not Jesus God. In the name of Jesus the man. Look what the next verse says. Jesus responds to them and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now this is a little bit of speculation but if you ever read the book of Job, you see the angels of God coming before the throne of God, appearing before him, and the devil comes in there as well. And jo God says, have you considered my servant Job? But the devil's able to enter in before God's presence. I believe even to this day, it says he's the accuser of the brethren. And so there he was in heaven, and all of a sudden he heard some commotion. Maybe some devil rushed up to greet him and say, we've got a problem on earth, something's going seriously wrong. What is it? Well, some of the devils were kicked out of humans. How? How does this happen? They just, they used the name of Jesus. And the devil fell from heaven like lightning, came shooting back down to the earth to see what in the world is going on. The first time ever in human history that devil, devils were subject to men. Where devils had to obey humanity because of this one overcoming man. So my theory is that by the time Jesus was prepared for ministry, he had become the perfect man. He had fulfilled all righteousness. In fact, when he got baptized, what did he say to John? I must do this. Why? To fulfill all righteousness. So he had become the perfect man. After he gets baptized, what happens to him? It says the Spirit drove him out into the wilderness. And there he was for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted of the devil. Being tested. Being tried. To see whether he or not he could become that overcoming man. He, he uh, accomplished and was successful in every point where Adam 
and you and I have failed. In all points, he was tempted, just like you are, and he was overcoming. He was never sinful. He never made the wrong decision when it came to sin, as a man. So when he had gained victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil, then he was given full authority over this planet. So much so, like I said, that he could literally walk on water. That he could cause the waves to stop going. Can you imagine? The waves were tossing the, way, uh, the boat all over the place. These disciples had been on a boat since they were knee high. And here they were, terrified of their lives. They thought they were going to die. These fishermen that had grown up on a boat. So it must have been a severe storm. And it's crashing. Jesus is sleeping in the back of the boat on a pillow. And there they are thinking they're going to die. Finally, they wake him up and say, Jesus, don't you care that we're all about to die? And he stands up. What is it? He, he rebukes the wind. Have you ever spoken to the wind? I've never tried that. But he had the full authority, and the earth was in such subjection to him that the wind literally listened to him. Wind, stop blowing! The earth became totally calm. The sea was flat and calm. There was not a ripple in it. I can imagine seeing the reflection of the moon off of the, the waves, out, or off of the flat, calm a sea after that. It would be incredible to be there, to see a man exercising his full authority over this planet. Back to our text. Hebrews 2.11 For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call us brethren. This is where, it, to me, it just becomes really awesome. Where it really hits home. And you know, we see the power of Jesus. We see this great man that we can't even come anywhere near to. Here's a man that we should actually bow down and worship but now it's saying that this man is not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. He's not ashamed to call us brethren. Not ashamed to associate himself with us. That's awesome. Porn addict. Druggy. Really? Child molesters. Rapists. The worst of the worst. God has found a way in which Jesus, the Savior of the world needs not to be ashamed to call you his brother. Isn't that awesome? I'm the brother of Jesus. After all that I've done, after all that I've thought, after all that I would have done if I had not been stopped by somebody, Jesus calls me his brother. He's not even ashamed to call me his brother. That's awesome. Hebrews 12, 2, 12 through 15. Saying, he's not ashamed to call us brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church I will sing praise unto thee. And I, again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children, that's you and I, are partakers of flesh and blood. I hope all of you are flesh and blood. When you cut, cut you bleed, right? As much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And I love the way the scriptures words that it's like it's he's becoming redundant. He also himself likewise. It's like how many more times can you say that? Try to bring this point across. You've already said that he is like us. He also himself likewise took part of the same. The same what? The same flesh and blood. He was not other. He was not an ulterior human. He was not superhuman. He also himself likewise took part of the same. Why? That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And, what else? Verse 15. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Are you afraid of death? I mean, really. Really? I can, sometimes you can ask somebody in public, are you afraid to die? They'll say, no, I'm not, I'm not scared to die. And that's cool, sounds fun, sounds nice, sounds tough. But really, have you ever been at a place where you thought maybe you might not make it out? Most of us probably haven't. But if you ever let yourself into that, when you're alone, when you're by yourself, and you're considering the end of all that you know, entering into what you have never seen before, going through this veil of flesh to spirit and entering into a new realm, it's a scary thought. To stand before God and give an account for all that you've done, as 
uh, Nick was saying before, your internet history. Pick up your phone and show everybody what's on your phone. Would you like to see that? Would you like everybody here to see that? If you, when you entered into this room today, if there was this holographic image of every thought you've thought for the last month, would you have come today? Probably not. You wouldn't want everybody to see where you're at. But on the day of judgment, you're going to stand before God and all your deeds will be made manifest. It's a scary thing. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, the Bible says. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. You will stand alone in God's spotlight. Everything else will be clouded out. You will not consider anybody else, anything else. You alone will stand before God and give an account for what you've done. Are you ready for that? That's scary. What did Jesus do? He came to save those that all their lifetime were in subject to bondage through the fear of death. It's the fear of death that causes so much trouble and strife on this planet. Everybody's afraid to die. And Jesus came to destroy the devil and to free us who through all our lifetime were in subject to bondage through fear of death. Hebrews 4, 15, a couple chapters after it says, For we have not in high priest, speaking of Jesus, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. To me this is astonishing. In the exact same sense that you and I are made of flesh and blood, Jesus the Almighty God took part of the same type of body. Why would the great Creator God subject Himself to a mortal, physical, corruptible body? Why? That He might destroy Him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So the devil had some say in what happens to the dead. This is a different topic altogether, but in the story of Abraham, or the rich man and Lazarus, we see two people die. The rich man was an evil man who didn't uh, give a care for people. The rich, the poor man, Lazarus, was a man that worshipped God but had not many goods. They both ended up going down into the heart of the earth. One was on the side in the flames in torment, and there was a great cavern fixed between the two. On the other side was this place called Abraham's bosom, and that's where Lazarus was being comforted, being fed, being well taken care of. I don't believe they were in heaven. I don't believe the rich man was looking up through the clouds into heaven. I believe they were both down in the heart of the earth. And the devil would not allow these Old Testament saints, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the rich man, I mean Lazarus rather, David, all these different men, they were not allowed to go to heaven. They had sin on them. They had not obeyed God perfectly also, just like you and I. So they were not rightfully able to go into heaven. And so they were being held in that compartment until the day when Jesus came. The Bible says when Jesus died, he went down into the heart of the earth and he preached to the spirits in prisons, many other things it says. But it says when he rose up from the grave that many of the saints were seen in the streets of Jerusalem with him. And I gather from that that many of those saints that were kept there from that time, from their lifetime to this point, were brought up onto the earth and then taken up into heaven finally, able to enter into the presence of God for the first time. Because now there was a man that could bring them to God. Finally, there was a sinless man, a perfect man, a righteous man that had full authority and power over this earth and now was able to gain access into heaven because of his overcoming life. Not because he was God, but because he had lived perfectly as a man. Verse 16 and 17. For verily Jesus took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that's us, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. Behooved means that there was a necessity laid upon Jesus. It became his duty in order to become the Savior, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Now, could Jesus have been our Savior at the age of six? No, he couldn't. He wasn't ready. He was not a perfect man. At the age of 12, he was wise. He was teaching the scholars in the temple. Was he ready to be our Savior? No, he wasn't. He was not complete. 
He was not perfect. He was God. He was the Son of God. But He could not save us from the dominion of the devil that He had over our death. But when He became 30 years old, He was ready. He went down to the river. He got baptized. He went into the wilderness and He took His final test. He overcame the devil. He overcame the world and the flesh. And He became the overcoming man that had authority over all this planet. You can never tell Jesus that he doesn't know what it's like. You can never tell him that he had an unfair advantage and that, yeah, I, I could do it too if I was the Son of God. He laid that all aside and became like one unto us. It says that in all things he was made like unto his brethren. Matthew 13, 41 says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. You ever thought about that? So often we think, well, Son of Man, that it's referring to Jesus, Jesus is God, and then it all makes sense. No. The people that were listening to him in his day thought he was just a carpenter. And here he is pointing to himself saying, the Son of Man, me, I'm going to send my angels. Really? You've got angels? Yeah, I'm going to send my angels, and they're going to do something for me. And they're going to gather out of all the kingdom all things which offend and them that do iniquity. And the people in his day just thought, this guy's off his rocker. He's lost some marbles. This, he's out of his mind. Literally, his friends and family thought he had gone crazy. A man that says, I have angels in heaven, and I'm going to send them to the earth, and they're going to do certain things, and they do what I say. They come and go as I please. That's a little crazy. Matthew 19, 28, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, They which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Again, he says that when this new earth comes, and the new Jerusalem comes, and the old earth is made new, and there's a great big kingdom set up on this earth, it's going to be the Son of Man sitting on his throne. Have you ever pictured Jesus in heaven as the man, Christ Jesus? Things are really coming to a head now. At the end of the book of Matthew, Jesus is asked point blank a very direct question. The one question that he had been kind of evading, kind of beating around the bush sometimes even, it seemed. When they asked him if he was the Son of God, he would just change the, the answer or ask them a question back. He often would not give them a straight answer. But here he's being tried. He's about to be crucified. And the priest, the high priest, there was only one high priest in Jerusalem, he rose up and he said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? Jesus held his peace. He would not say a word. And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God. I'm commanding you by the name of God, the living God in heaven, that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Tell us. Once and for all, are you the Son of God? What does Jesus answer? He said unto him, Thou hast said. He assents to that. He says, yeah, that's true. It's, it's as you said. But, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter, in the future, ye shall see the Son of Man. Are you the Son of God? Yes, I am, but... Hereafter, when, I, when the Son of Man, when you see Him coming in the clouds of heaven, the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Are you the Son of God? Yeah, but when you see me coming, I'm going to be the man, Christ Jesus, sitting at the right hand of the Almighty God, coming in the clouds of heaven with power, with my angels, with my saints, all authority and power given unto the Son of Man. And what does the priest do? The priest rent his clothes and saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now you've heard his blasphemy. This man is claiming that he's going to sit at the right hand of God. There's no man that's allowed to get into heaven. Just walk in there and sit down at God's right hand. How dare he say something like that? I love his answer. Another passage quickly, John chapter 5. Jesus is speaking, it's a long sermon there, but he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead, picture it, in the future, all the saints are in their graves, when the dead 
shall hear the voice of the Son of God, the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. Well, that makes sense to me. The Son of God takes people and raises them out of the grave. That I can understand. That works. And they that hear shall live, verse 26, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Notice that transition. He just admitted that he was the Son of God. The graves are going to be opened because of the voice of the Son of God. But the only reason he has a right to judge us and the only reason he has the ability to save us is because he is the Son of Man. John chapter 5, 27. Beautiful verse. Hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this. He says, don't be amazed at this. Actually, at the end of this sermon, most of his disciples leave. And then he turns to his twelve and says, you guys want to leave too? He says some crazy things about eating his flesh and drinking his blood and people just shaking their head and walk away and they want nothing to do with him anymore. He says, don't marvel at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, referring to himself, and shall come forth out of the graves, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So to me, that awesome passage that confirms that it was absolutely necessary that Jesus be a man. It behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. He was perfected through suffering so that he could become our Savior. Do you see this man? John 6, 62. What? And if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before. So again, he's throwing that term around, Son of Man. He's referring to himself as just a common man. He says, what if you see me ascend up back into heaven where I was before? Would you be amazed at that? One last passage really quickly. Uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 56. The uh, church had just started getting formed. The um, deacons had just been nominated. There was seven deacons. One of them was Stephen. He was a very bold man that went out into the streets preaching everywhere, preaching everywhere that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, and the Jews hated him. He was so bold and so confident, so full of wisdom in the Holy Ghost, that they decided to put an end to this man because he was causing too much of a ruckus. And there's a big back and forth, a big battle, a big trial, and he stands before them completely bold. And finally, they're about to kill him. They're all picking up stones. They drag him out of the city. They're about to stone him to death. And he says, Behold! Everybody stops like, what? Behold, I see the heavens opened. He looks up into heaven and he sees this vision. He gets to look right into heaven. And he says, And the Son of Man, standing on the right hand of God. Isn't that awesome? Here's a man, one of us, in trouble on the earth. And there's our man, our representative, our advocate, our go-between, our mediator, he's, he's not sitting at the right hand of God now. He's standing up. He's standing up to watch over, to guard over his people. If that doesn't give you confidence, nothing will. We have a man in heaven who stands on our behalf, who speaks on our behalf, who ever lives to make intercession for us. A man. Can you imagine the first time that Jesus ascended up into heaven and knocked on the big gates of heaven? And if you read back in Psalm 22, I believe it's a reference to that. The angels inside say, who is, who's here? Who's knocking? He says, it's the King of glory. Who is this King of glory? And he says, I'm the strong, mighty to save, the King of glory. And they allow him to come in, the first man ever to enter in to heaven. And now you and I have full access to God on the grounds of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Because he's the perfect overcoming man. Because he's the perfect substitute. He became the perfect Lamb of God, as Chris mentioned before. Awesome. To me, that's just awesome. I, I, nothing gives me more confidence, more joy, more freedom to know that I can approach God at any time. Because we've got a man up there. He's our lawyer. 
He's the one that reaches one hand up into heaven, takes hold of God because He's God. But He reaches down into earth and takes hold of us because He's one of us. And He can bring the two parties together, which before could never be brought together. They were at constant enmity with one another since the time of Adam. And now, finally, there's somebody to bring us together. That's the gospel. It's good news. That should give you courage. That should give you excitement and confidence to know that you can approach God. Not because you're a good person, because there was a good person, based on the works and the merits and the blood of Jesus. All right. Amen. Thank you. You're coming back up, John?